nucleus and arcuate incisions. Uh, it, in the incisions, you can see it gives you the desired desired location of the incision. It can be, however, whenever whenever we have a dark, uh, we have a dense arcus. It is very difficult to penetrate this dense arcus because the FSL cannot uh, cannot penetrate opaque structures. And you can see this in this video. The second is the incision that <coughs> become. Uh, you you see that the incisions. Sorry, the incisions. Now I just go back a little. Like, sorry, this is not functioning. Uh, this, as I told you, these are the incisions which are. You can see that the incisions in this case are difficult to. We are very difficult because. We have an opaque, uh, we have a carcass annulus at the limbus and in these cases you have to make the incisions with finally with the keratome. Although it penetrates uh, partially, the, you cannot penetrate fully because the, the energy doesn't reach, reach the posterior leg. Uh, initially the incisions were also too corneal. We find that the initials with initials are too corneal because uh, the, <coughs> the 2D representation of the video monitor uh, uh, actually is a representation of 3D structure of the curved cornea and limbus. So we find that the incisions are pretty corneal and therefore what we did was that to avoid this cornea incision we started marking the limbus. You can see that the limbus is marked with gentian violet. And then we can make this, and we actually, after we make these incisions, so that we take them more sclerer by actually forcing the incisions to go more sclerer on the monitor. Because otherwise sometimes these incisions become very corneal. They look look on the monitor as if they are, they are limbal, but they are too corneal. And therefore what we have started doing is, as showed you, started marking the limbus with gentian violet, and taking the uh, while setting on the on the uh, on the uh, the or the main incision, what we did do is that we drag this incision onto this gentian violet mark, and then then what happens is that we get an opening at the limbus. This is one of the factors which are <coughs> uh, which is one of the reasons why the incisions do not come out well and they come out too corneal, because as I said, it is it is a two D structure on the monitor and the cornea and the sclera are the 3D structures, so the representation is not exact. Uh, as you said, capsulated this, we get perfect circular, well center, desired size and adequate strength, and therefore you get a consistent ELSP, ELP effective length position, and therefore it's important in cases of premium IOLs. And it's also definitely at home in intumescent and mature cataracts which roll to show us. Now, we get an effective lens position. In the effective lens position, we get a total cover of the... We get a total cover of the lens. Now, in an inter intermittent cataract, we can see that Argentinian flag sign here. You see the lens? We can see the laser emission now in this mature cataract and then after this and we are using a grid, uh, grid pattern and then we see that a very nice circular capsular axis which comes out to the and we stain it to just to show you what a good capsular axis we can get in an intumescent cataract. Absolutely circular. Now for nuclear fragmentation. It reduces ultrasound energy for all gates of cataract. It reduces nuclear softening and also produces planes of cleavage planes in the nucleus. 
it reduces the over over overall peak of energy delivered in the eye, and this has been conclusively shown that it reduces the peak of delivered in the eye by about 50 percent. And even in brown and black cataracts, we found that the energy gets gets reduced as, as considerably, and therefore it's invaluable even in the even in the brown cataracts. We earlier we thought that this is not meant for beyond grade two cataracts, but for grade four cataracts and leathery cataracts, we also find it very useful. Now this is a grade four cataract. You can see that the laser, laser energy is being emitted, and this is the chop and the two cylinder pattern. And you can see that, <coughs> and you can see these bubbles coming up from after the energy is reduced. Now what we do in the cylinder pattern is that we can just remove the cylinder, but only by aspiration. And no FACO energy. Cent central cord can be re re removed by aspiration. This is very rare. Normally, in FACO emulsification, you would, this is the densest part of the nucleus, and you would not be able to use it. Only you do not remove it by as uh, aspiration only. And then you can impale these fragments, and you can see how well you can impale these fragments after the central cord has been aspirated, and then remove these. One by one. In fact, you can first get four quadrants and then you can subdivide them into eight and emulsify them with very low energy. Again, we find that the energy required is extremely low, it, and uh, and the emulsification of the central core, uh, the central fiber, takes place so well that very little energy is required. The frag pattern really softens the central core of the nucleus. Uh, now this is a frag pattern for the a uh, very brown grade four nucleus. You can say that the laser emission is being done, and you again have a frag pattern here. Now this frag pattern, you can see on the the eye now. The frag pattern has softened the central pores of nucleus. Er, er, nucleus earlier that was the cylindrical pattern. This is the frag pattern. The energy required is a little more in this case, but it again softens the nucleus to a great extent so that the central core can only be aspirated, almost aspirated with very little energy. And then you have these <coughs> eight shops. Again, again you can engage and you can separate them. You can see the cleavage planes. It's a very leathery cataract, extremely leathery cataract. And see the energy that is going, 3.58 CDE. And by the end of surgery, we would have actually gone on to about 18 or 20 CD, or even 30, 25, 30. But this ends with very this this energy required in this case is about 15 to 16 CD. So definitely, it does make people say it doesn't, but it does make a difference in softening the nucleus to a great extent and providing cleavage planes from which you don't you just have to separate these cleavage planes. You don't really have to chop. And for astigmatism, you can see now that the laser emission will start. Uh, we, uh, we can show you some the arcuate incisions. You can correct mild to moderate degree of astigmatism. Now again, you can see the laser emission started. And the last to be performed are the arcuate incisions. You can see these beautiful arcuate incisions which are created after the eye is made taut. And they are of exact depth, exact size, exact architecture, and you open them up with a bland run spatula. As you can see, you can open them up, and up to one to one and a half, or half diopters of extinct metal can get corrected with this. So it's, in these cases, you don't require a toric lens. <coughs> and then now, the, uh, the learning curve. Avoid too much of topical anesthesia. It can lead to corneal haze and compromise, uh, compro compromise your clarity. This is very important because it, I found that if you put too much of paracaine, it, it, and when you dock, after you dock, when you start surgery, your cornea is hazy. Uh, uh, another problem is the meiosis following laser application. And this we have got over by uh, giving preoperative pre NSAIDs. This we prescribe two days before surgery and use intracameral adrenaline when this happens. And you can 
C in this case. You will see that intracameral adrenaline, how the pupil is beautifully dilated after putting intracameral adrenaline. See that? So it was a small pupil and it dilated beautifully after putting intracameral adrenaline. Again, while opening incisions, you have to be careful because these are blunt spatula and you can have a desmith detachment and we have had, we have had so small desmith detachment when we uh, when we open up the incision and there we have to be little careful. If you are not able to, able to uh, open up the internal incision, do it with a, uh, with a knife rather than uh, push the endothelium and the desmase because sometimes that can lead to a desmase detachment. Ensure that the capsule excess <coughs> is complete with a needle or the forceps. This is very important so that you know that no tags are left and then you remove the capsule excess with the forceps. Most of the cases now, 99% cases, you get a free floating capsule excess, but otherwise earlier we used to get tags and it was essential to, uh, to separate them in, with the needle so that we don't know, we know where the tag is. Uh, these are the cases we had of incomplete capsule rexis. You can see on top here, there was an incomplete capsule rexis, then we completed it with, with the forceps. So finally you see how, so this is a case of an incomplete capsule rexis which was completed with the forceps. This has happened earlier with us when the machine was not functioning very well, but uh, after the, the energy has been titrated and calibrated properly, this mm -hmm. doesn't occur. Another case is this, in which you, there you can see an impression was made of the capsule rexis, but this was not cut properly, so we had to complete it ma manually again. Uh, hydro dissection has to be slow. As you can see, hydro dissection has to be very slow and controlled, and you inject small, small volume, volume to decompress. You can go inside with 26 gauge needle, inject there is called a, uh, the hydro uh, the fluid, and then compress, and so that the air bubbles come out from the uh, capsule bag and into into the anterior chamber, and you do not have a blowout of the posterior capsule. So the true picture is introduction of this new technology however has been accompanied by a host of new clinical, clinical, logistical and financial challenges for the surgeon. Are the outcomes better? Let us, uh, we have to evaluate for the surgeon, for the patient <coughs> clinically and also is it worth the cost for the surgeon or for the patient. One thing is for sure that if you have the two Two, uh, two instruments at two places, your FACO theater separate and your, and your, um, and the theater where you, and where you put your lift, the machine, your femto machine is at two different places and increases your, your time, surgical time. Also, it requires additional space. It, can, it adds considerable cost to a currently standard procedure. Also cost in terms of time, as I said, in time and also in manpower because you require somebody to assist you in this procedure. It's just impossible that you go about doing it alone. So you require somebody to definitely assist you. Limitations are in cooperative patients, patients with tremens, dementia, deep set orbits are very difficult because sometimes you cannot dock so easily. Nystagmus, again advanced glaucoma is also a contraindication because in elderly patients with the optic nerve head, uh, uh, um, already compromised, you could be increasing the intraocular pressure could lead, lead to a problem. Sometimes, although in the catalyst they say the pressure rise is less than the lens X. And pterygium, corneal opacities, OSDs and poorly dilating pupils are also contraindications. But I think the sp uh, subsequent speakers will tell us how to, how to deal with these, these situations. Now, is it likely to replace manual surgery in the future? or will cataract search skills be reduced or become redundant? These are two very pertinent questions. So 
surgeons basically prefer to prepare to revert to traditional phaco emulsification method at any time. So every surgeon has to be well trained in phaco. This is not a substitute. Flex, flex may now <clears throat> may allow less experienced surgeons to obtain better results. However, the good experienced surgeons in good experienced surgeons it has failed to demonstrate a significant improvement. It is therefore likely to flatten the curve with surgeons attaining similar outcomes across the board. So that is what it will do, that everybody will have similar results, even the surgeons who cannot perform phaco surgery so easily and can't produce a good capsule, etc., etc., will be able to do it and therefore it will flatten that curve and a large portion of uh, patients will have good results. And this study that we did 122 eyes, uh, we we uh, found and cataracts ranging from two to grade two to grade four. We found that 89 percent, about 89, 80, 80, 84 percent had uh, UCVA of uh, <coughs> UCVA with uh, radiator, but we had we had we had uh, with uncorrected vision had uh, the six six or better vision. 98% were within, uh, 83% were, were, sorry, 83 were within half a diopter of the correction and 98% were within one diopter of the correction and the UCV. And <coughs> what uh, okay, I sum it up by saying that the, the other thing we have noticed is firstly is the uncorrected visual cavity in 98% cases, cases has been within one diopter and within half a diopter about 84% cases. And the CD used is how, how we, have, we have also seen that CD used is about 8 compared to uh, an average CD of 8 to 9 rather than what we would have used would be 15 or 16 needed in a paper power. Where the incisions are concerned, it's not such a great instrument for incisions, but definitely it is a great instrument for give, give, giving you clear corneas first post operative day, even in hard cataracts. Thank you very much.